Hola, buenas tardes. Creo que estamos al aire. Eh, bienvenidos todos a la charla informativa, a nuestro seminario, a nuestra conversación eh, proveniente desde el diplomado en pedagogía crítica que provee la Universidad Metropolitana de Ciencias de la Educación. El día de hoy eh, tenemos invitados estelares y vamos a aprovechar el momento para también dar las gracias a todas las personas que están presentes hoy. Eh, be very welcome, all of you, uh, to this, uh, I won't say conference, but conversation perhaps, or um, chatting with some really well-known authors. And uh, the idea for today is trying to listen to what they can say to us about critical pedagogy and uh, trying to inform you, the audience, about the uh, diploma we have uh, at UMSE uh, about critical pedagogy. Uh, to begin with, we're going to have some few words from our one of, our, one of the members of our diploma, uh, Professor Cristian Sánchez. Eh, secretario de Facultad de la Facultad de Historia, Geografía y Letras. Así que, Cristian. Thank you, thank you, Emilio. Thank you, Emilio, and thanks everybody uh, for being here. It's um, really an honor for us to uh, be able to host this very important activity. Um, Well, my name is Christian Sanchez. I'm the academic coordinator of uh, the faculty that um, uh, is kind of um, supporting this, um, this seminar and, and also the diploma. I also belong to the English department at UMSE, and I'm really happy to, to be here on behalf of all the authorities of the university uh, to welcome you all uh, to this um, important activity, this uh, seminar. Uh, this is our second seminar um, that is organized by the uh, Diploma. Uh, this very important program that we are actually um, also promoting. We're also part of this Diploma, this program that we are offering. And as part of that, uh, we are um, having these activities for the community uh, so as to share uh, our experiences and our thoughts on uh, this very important issue not only English pedagogy, but also um, the critical uh, sides, um, the critical side to that. Um, so again, on behalf of all the, the authorities uh, from the faculty, from the university, uh, from the English department as well, I welcome you all and let's um, have this um, very um, interesting conversation with the, with the authors, with the researchers. And let's um, hope that um, this activity or the presence in this activity correlates with uh, um, the enrollment in our diploma, which is very important for, uh, for us as well. So we, um, we welcome you and we invite you to, uh, for those who are interested in this, you are also going to be interested in the program itself um, to get enrolled in the program uh, so we can uh, continue uh, sharing experiences uh, during this semester. So. Thank you very much for being here. It's an honor to have you here, and I hope to see you very soon in other activities. Muchas gracias, Christian. Uh, in, in order to continue, we're going to leave uh, our coordinator, the diploma coordinator, Mr. Maximiliano Acuña, to, for a few words on this. Uh, Maximiliano. Muchas gracias, Emilio. Me das un segundo que estoy aquí apoyando también el... el la parte técnica, entonces tengo que hacer ambas cosas eh, al mismo momento. Ahí sí, listo. Eh, muchas gracias por la presentación. Eh, muy brevemente, eh, comentarle a todos los asistentes que en la Universidad Metropolitana de Ciencia de la Educación, en específico del Departamento de Inglés, eh, Vamos, eh, estamos ofreciendo ¿cierto? un programa de diplomado en pedagogía crítica en la enseñanza del inglés como lengua extranjera. Los eh, invitamos cordialmente a revisar, eh, vamos a dejar en el chat en algunos minutos el link directo para que puedan revisar todos los detalles del programa, evidentemente para no quitarle tiempo a lo que realmente venimos, que es escuchar a nuestros panelistas, ¿cierto?, eh, no le vamos a dar todos los detalles, pero tenemos eh, brevemente, son cuatro meses de programa, está pensado desde septiembre hasta enero, 
hasta mediados de enero, eh, es un programa que tiene clases de taller y clases, es clases online, es totalmente en e-learning, eh, vamos a tener también invitados de, de otras partes, eh, son cinco grandes asignaturas, introducción a la pedagogía crítica, eh, evaluación y currículum en pedagogía crítica, eh, pedagogía feminista, descolonización del lenguaje eh, y del inglés como idioma extranjero y eh, prácticas pedagógicas y pedagogía crítica, ¿cierto?, aplicada en, en, en nuestro sistema escolar. Eh, estamos invitando no tan solo a profesores de inglés, sino también a profesores de otras áreas o profesores que también quizás se desempeñen en áreas de educación superior. También estamos enfocándolo desde ahí eh, para hacer los bienvenidos, como les digo, eh, con los correos que nos, ustedes se han inscrito. Les vamos a estar mandando un, un díptico con información o si ustedes mismos quieren solicitar, nos pueden mandar. Como les digo, les vamos a dejar un... Eh, el link directo de la página web de educación continua de nuestra universidad en el chat para que puedan, eh, digamos, eh, revisar la información de, de, ese, de, de nuestro diplomado. ¿ya? Agradecerles eh, a los presentadores de este, de, este, de este día, de esta sesión, porque recordemos que son tres, nos fue una sesión más en la quincena de septiembre, 13 de septiembre, si mal no recuerdo, así que también están desde ya cordialmente invitados a esa última sesión de estos tres seminarios que hicimos de pedagogía crítica que estamos realizando desde el Departamento de Inglés. Eso, profesor, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Maximiliano. Voy a aprovechar de, eh, ahora sí, saludar a los dos autores que nos acompañan esta noche. Eh, profesora Malva Barahona, eh, muchas gracias por estar acá. Y and also the, the really well-known uh, author, Mr. Michael Apple. Voy a aprovechar también de hacer la posición política, voy a decir esto en inglés, eh, estamos personalmente muy y no decir esto en inglés, ¿no? Estamos personalmente muy eh, contentos de poder tener a ambos en esta oportunidad. Agradecemos profundamente su ayuda y esperamos que eh, la charla del día de hoy pueda dar un poco más de luz respecto a lo que nos contiene acá, ¿no? So, uh, so to begin with, and just to let the authors start their presentations, I will introduce, uh, I don't know how to say, right? But Mr. Michael Apple, right? I don't know, Professor Apple, if you're there. I am here. There you are. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Well, it is a pleasure to be here, uh, even though it is virtual and not in person. Yeah. Some of you know I have acted in solidarity with movements in Chile for many years. Uh, And because of that, I must begin, oddly enough, with an apology. Unfortunately, I come from the belly of the beast, the United States. And that means that we assume that the rest of the world speaks English. I did learn in secondary school Espanol, but it was pure Castellano. So I learned to say, me llamo Miguel Manzana. Uh, and uh, because of my embarrassment, since the city I was from in the United States, was 40% Puerto Ricano, uh, it meant that I was embarrassed every time I tried to speak, since no one said gracias and things like that. So I do appreciate your English uh, and uh, am very sorry that because I am from the uh, empire, uh, it means that I must uh, be listened to not in Espanol. Um, I want to begin Uh, by talking about what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to talk about what critical pedagogic work is about, what are the questions that it asks, why are these important, and I want to be honest in the second part of my brief talk about the challenges that it faces since it is being attacked. Many teachers are resigning or losing their positions as they do it, and I want to be honest about that, but I want to end optimistically. I want to give a practical example of what it looks like when it is successful, when it deals honestly with class and race and gender, when it deals honestly with using education to transform cities and local power relations. So while the first half may seem, oh my Dios, it is so difficult. There are thousands of examples throughout Latin America, uh, throughout the United States and England, throughout Africa. So we must be optimistic about this. 
In fact, as some of you may know from reading my own work, I've worked in Brazil since 1986 and have participated in the formation of the citizen school and participatory budgeting. So I know from countries near you um, that uh, these things are hard to take away once they are established. So let me again, we cannot understand critical pedagogy or any form of critical education unless we understand that it is part of a larger project. That in order to transform society and its relations of dominance and exploitation, and to build movements against those relations, we have to change students. Since they are fundamental institutions in the society, and often for poor children in particular, rather than being, as we say, in English cooled out, that is failing school, and then having their first taste of what reality is like in many ways, it is absolutely crucial for students at the bottom of society to learn how to participate as critical citizens that have a voice and have power. So changing education is a fundamental act in engaging with those relations and giving students and teachers identities as agents, as actually able to work in the transforming of their institutions. So it is connected to what we might call critical participatory democracy. Now, democracy is a dangerous word because the right uses it as well as the left. And for the right, democracy is simply consumer product purchasing. So education is just like buying bread, buying even toilet paper. And schools are good only if there are test scores that are high. And we will try and keep the budget low for those schools that must serve the most oppressed groups those barrios that are often near Santiago, for an example. So the, when the right uses democracy, it is a neoliberal vision, a vision of consumerism. As long as I have a choice, that is all that's needed in education. For the left, especially the left that is deeply committed to critical participatory democracy, democracy is full participation. It is parents, community activists, students themselves deeply involved in building and transforming their institutions in having a voice in curriculum and pedagogy and a voice that is strong. Well, that means that certain, certain questions tend to be asked in critical pedagogy, critical pedagogic forms. The first is a serious one. It's not an easy one actually, but it is the original question in curriculum. What knowledge should we teach? Whose knowledge should we teach? Who decides? Who benefits from the knowledge that is now there? And what um, Pierre Macheret, the famous French left uh, cultural theorist, what's the knowledge that's absent? What is not taught? And in fact, often what is missing is even more important than what is there then not only who benefits, but even more important, how do we interrupt this? What is the role of education then, again, in challenging the kinds of knowledge that is and is not taught? And that requires that teachers have certain rights as well as responsibilities. And it means that the teacher's role is to be a mentor, to actually demonstrate why these social commitments are so crucial. And that's, that's very important. This is critical pedagogy is not only about students, not only about responsiveness to communities. It's about the rights of teachers collectively and individually to participate in social transformation. And as you know, throughout the world, increasingly, even under sometimes leftist governments, good teaching is being redefined not as participatory, but a simply measured gain on national examinations. I'll give one example of that in the United States, not under Donald Trump, the devil, but under um, Barack Obama, someone that uh, was reformist and not as strong as many of us hoped for. 
But his policy was that teachers' raises, their pay, and getting more money the next year were dependent on raising test scores. Now, let me repeat that. Here is a progressive president, like many progressive presidents, who is caught, surrounded by people who believe that education is simply about test scores. And in 48 of the 50 states in my own nation, in the United States, teachers were paid by how well the students did on the national examination. Not whether they learned about anti-racism, not whether the curriculum was connected, to it, but whether the students did well. And the effects of this were monstrous. So when we did research and asked students, uh, did they like to read? The answer was, I hate it. I quote from one seven-year-old who used quite profane language and said, reading sucks. I hate it. Now that's quite powerful. Yes, the students had higher test scores that didn't change their outcomes later on in life but they learned to despise the school and could not wait to be a school leader because of the transformative politics that even affected progressives. Okay? Now, we are faced then, in many ways, with complicated ideas about how to interrupt this. And in order to deal with that, we have to understand what is the location of critical pedagogy in society? What are the social movements not of that are progressive in fighting for teacher syndicates, in fighting for community participation, in determining the curriculum? But these are groups in many ways who are making it almost impossible in many nations for teachers to engage in this. Let me give some examples of this now. There are four groups that have formed what Gramsci would call a new hegemonic bloc. And they are gaining power in increasingly, for instance, even in Brazil, uh, in uh, even with the new election in Colombia, where the new president will have to fight massively about this. Certainly, these are visible even now uh, in your great nation, in Chile. Even though you have a new president, it is quite clear that these groups uh, can be described by one thing about the right. The right never sleeps. All gains are temporary. Mm -hmm. So there are four groups who are engaged in this new hegemonic block. And this is what we are facing. The first group is what we call neoliberals, and they believe one simple thing. Um, schools should be commodities. They should be put on a market. If they can be purchased, that is good. The state then is the source of a dilemma. We must shrink the state and give money to corporations. I need not tell you the repressive apparatus that you, you know, that you suffered in Chile, but I can tell you that three of my close friends, their parents were dropped from helicopters. I, I am ashamed to even say this in Chile given the emotional forms that go with them. But it's something I take quite seriously. All right, there's a second group. And that group is what we might want to call new conservatives. And they also believe that the state is evil, but they have a cultural, not just an economic agenda. And that agenda says this, we must have a national curriculum. And that national curriculum must teach patriotism, it must teach only economically useful knowledge and anything else like the humanities or other things like great Chilean poetry, as an example, or the sociology of racialized forms, the history, for instance, of Mapuche. All of those kinds of things should be thrown out because they are not economically profitable. Uh, there is a third group that we call authoritarian populists, and these are religious fundamentals who are very, very important. And in fact, they are the people who have brought us, in many ways, the support of Bolsonaro in Chile, excuse me, in Brazil, 
and Donald the Devil Trump in the United States. You'll forgive me for calling Donald Trump the devil, um, but I can't say his name without that. Otherwise, my heart begins to pound. I don't want to give him any more publicity than that. And this group believes one simple thing, that we must return to God as they define it. Uh, and if God said it, we believe it. And in the process, this is a, often called the theology of prosperity, but they are attacking schools throughout the world around issues of sexuality, issues of the body. So they think that uh, gays must be jailed, they're outlawing same-sex relationships, and they're increasingly strong. Finally, and many of these are people who might have voted for Gabriel Borek, these are people who believe uh, that uh, this, is, this is the new middle class, new middle professional class, and they believe one simple thing. If it moves in classrooms, measure it. And if it doesn't move today, measure it anyway, in case it moves tomorrow. And again, they provide support for a curriculum of testing, measurement, and I think the destruction and de-skilling of teachers of teachers losing authority and often losing their skills and rights to build a curriculum that is more responsible. So again, these are, these are the forces that are now building again. And as I mentioned in Chile and Brazil and in many, many nations like my own, it is this is what we are facing. So we cannot do anything unless we situate critical pedagogy and our work in teaching English or any other subject, unless we understand and are honest about these groups will not go into the darkness easily. They are found, they're funded in many ways on racializing forms, on a belief that capitalism will solve anything. And they will often um, support English language diplomas and English language teaching not because it is responsive and teachers are deeply talented as you are in dealing with those things, but simply because English is an international language of commerce. Now, I don't want to dismiss that, but it seems to me that that is not the only reason that one would be teaching and creating citizens of the world. Okay. So this is what we are facing now. I want to turn in the concluding section, the last 10 minutes or so, from this pessimism of these are the forces. Now, as Gramsci would say, Michael, what we want you to do when you have pessimism of the intellect is have optimism of the will. That is optimism, not simply that we can will it, but people are not puppets. No teacher in a public or private school is a puppet. They have agency. And they work extraordinarily hard, simply often because they are faced with from 40 students to 100 students, depending on whether you're in an affluent area or a poor area. And when facing that, they know that they have ethical as well as pedagogic responsibility. So what would the alternative look like? I want to take us into one of the poorest cities of the United States and also a very conservative place economically. The city is Baltimore. It is very near Washington, D.C. It is on the East Coast. The city is 70 to 80% people of color. That would be African-Americans, uh, Latino and Latina groups who have come up uh, from oppressive nations or fleeing violence or looking for an economic better, better life for their children. Uh, many Asian Americans, Hmong, Rohingya, people who are fleeing oppression. And the schools of the city are 90% what we call minoritized. And we also know that 60 to 70% of those students, when they do get to secondary school, will probably not finish in the four or five years that is given for free secondary school. And there is a group of mathematics teachers uh, called the Algebra Project. 
and their funding was cut. Now, the algebra project is one of the most well-known social justice mathematics programs in the United States for elementary, middle, and secondary school. And teachers, again, spend a year learning how to take official knowledge, knowledge that often is the sorting device for failure in schools. So as an example, how you do in beginning algebra in secondary schools or advanced elementary schools in the United States, that one course determines whether you will be in advanced courses in any courses that are advanced in secondary schools, and at the same time, uh, whether you will um, basically be in what is called remedial mathematics, meaning you will be seen as not rational, as a failure already. Okay, So it's part of what we call the school to prison pipeline. How well you do in mathematics, in many ways, determines your life chances in these poor secondary school and poor communities. So the budget under neoliberal agencies has been cut for the school, and the budget has been given, as well as the budget for social welfare, for free meals for elderly, for um, health care, for poor communities. All of that has been cut, and the government instead has put that money in a program to build a new juvenile prison for the children who are arrested in that community. Now, the Algebra Project has said, we must work with students. Again, remember participatory democracy. And we must work with students and the families to try and stop this. And following Gramsci's understanding of curriculum, you don't throw away necessarily elite knowledge. You transform elite knowledge and connect it to the lived experiences of the communities and the students. And you use elite knowledge to subvert dominance, to fight back. Now, this is very interesting. It's a very different understanding of mathematics, very different. The think of mathematics as a language. Can we use that language and the skills that come with it to stop the alienation and to give agency to teachers and students? So they uh, were using a book of mine called Democratic Schools, and Paolo Freire's brilliant book that will never go out of date, called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It is the Bible of critical pedagogy in many ways. And they, instead of immediately beginning to teach mathematics, they spent the first week in discussions, identifying social problems that the students face. And these are 13 to 15 year old students in their first and second years of secondary school. Almost all of them African American, all of them. And the students debated and deliberated, and finally they came to consensus that the major problem is the arrest in the community. That even when the students are doing well in school, when they're walking with a group of their friends in the barrios, the police will often stop and search them. And if they talk back and say, I know my rights, you can't do this to me, why, why are you arresting me? They are then arrested and charged with resisting arrest. They go before a juvenile court justice, and many of them will wind up in jail. In fact, one out of every four African-American young men in my own state in Wisconsin has been or is now in what we call the injustice system. Jails, but not just. So the students began talking about this is our real problem. And uh, they also said, look, they're going to build, the city is going to build a new jail. And we know that with new space, it is more likely even more of us will be arrested. And we will spend two or three months in these juvenile jails, even before we see a judge because there is no money to support judges and defense lawyers, and we can't afford defense lawyers. So they began to talk about how can mathematics help us? And then the teachers entered, connecting it to the daily life 
and problems of being arrested, being fearful, given an identity of being stupid. And they began to say, well, one of the topics of the ninth, the first year of secondary school is elementary statistics. What should, what, what would we use mathematics and statistics for to help us? And the teachers and students again continue the joint deliberations. And they begin to use mathematics, things that they had failed before and actually didn't even study. Well, they would cut classes, they wouldn't go to class. And they use their statistics to find out how much taxes are collected from corporations and the banks in the city and how much in the poorest communities. And they found out that the top 25 banks in that state paid zero taxes. Nada, nothing. So poor people pay a much higher percentage of their very poor income than the richest corporations in that state. And then they found out as well that depending on where you live, the higher your grades were and the more opportunity. Classes were smaller, teachers had more professional training, lawyers were present. And they spent a very, very long time then finding out what the statistical data showed about the ways in which schools were connected to inequality and what the surrounding society was like. Then they began to talk, well, how do, how do we use this knowledge? It's not going to be for the test. Though, by the way, at the end of this, two thirds of the students scored one, high, uh, one standard deviation higher and a passing grade. So even in terms of elite forms and expectations, Barack Obama's performance pay model, the students actually succeeded. So they then contacted critical journalists and said, look, would you like to interview us? Here is what we found. And they joined with the workers' strikes and they contacted radio and TV people who are usually totally racist, who will interview not teachers, not students, but uh, the mayor of a city or someone in charge, an administrative arm of the state. And they use the stereotypes of poor Black children who get interviewed. They were so articulate, so knowledgeable about the mathematics, that when they spoke to mainstream journalists, the equivalent of La Nación, for instance, and other uh, widespread, largely conservative newspapers, the editors and the newspaper journalists said, my God, they were so surprised at how articulate poor African-American and Latino students were. Young girls and young boys who were able to argue brilliantly. And they were on TV three or four times a week on radio being interviewed. So what is the end point of this? Something that I think is a model that is powerful for all of us who are trying to think about what can we do with critical pedagogy? Is it simply academic or is it part of an answer to social transformation? At the end of this, because of all the publicity, the prison was not built and the money came back to social welfare, to the school, to the community. Just as importantly, the students made epistemological gains. They were seen as knowers. They were no longer stereotyped. And it transformed the possibilities of other schools and other districts using this as a model. So this creates not just the closing of a prison, but it creates new identities for, for oppressed youth, and it creates a demand among communities and elsewhere that this is the kind of things that we want. Now, this is absolutely crucial. Raymond Williams, a person, a British cultural theorist, has a brilliant idea. He said, look, we must never, we must never Forget the dangers. 
But part of our task is to restore hope, to restore the understanding that people have agency, to find practices that may be difficult to put in place, that must be defended as if our lives depended on it. But we must build these practices, not just because they restore hope, but because the lives of our children and our children's children depend on it. And this is, if you will, the reason that we study and do critical pedagogy. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Apple, for your encouraging words for the coming audience. Muchas gracias, profesor, eh, por su tan importante reflexión al final de su discurso. Vamos a continuar. Antes de continuar, quiero eh, comentar a la audiencia que pueden escribir sus preguntas. Al final de la siguiente presentación tendremos un breve eh, question and answer ¿no? con los autores. Eh, así que las pueden estar escribiendo ahora o mientras esté la segunda presentación también o al final de la segunda presentación. También recordamos, como al principio lo dijimos, eh, el profesor Cabezas, Diego, eh, lamentablemente no puede estar con nosotros, sufrió un, un accidente hoy en la mañana, esperemos esperamos todos nosotros que esté, que esté bien en este momento. Eh, dejo con ustedes, I, I, I want to introduce uh, Professor Barahona, Malva Barahona, from Universidad Católica de Chile, a researcher, language trainer, no, teacher trainer, sorry, and eh, probablemente una de las expertas importantes en, en nuestro país. Profesora, muchísimas gracias por estar acá. Muchas gracias a ustedes. Eh, ¿Puedo pedirles que me den eh, permiso para compartir mi pantalla, por favor? Ya está listo, profesora. Está habilitado. Gracias. So, are you looking at my screen? Like, um, yeah? Yep. Sí, sí, estamos viendo la versión de presentador. Sí. Um, estamos, sí. ¿Por qué me hace? Yeah. Okay. Now it should be working, right? Sí, estamos viendo su pantalla. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you a, a, just a very short anecdote that um, I experienced uh, kind of January last year. Um, I was visiting one university from our country Um, I was sharing some research results, some findings, and one person from the audience was a student teacher, a student teacher of English. Um, this student teacher was uh, finishing um, his program, his studies, so um, he was really happy to be there and, and talk about uh, how proud he felt of being a teacher of English. So, and I was really happy to have time with him and so as to answer his questions, etc. So, and then um, we continued talking and he started telling me about a project he had been working all last year, I mean, for a couple of years or more. And uh, this project, he told me with uh, a lot of enthusiasm that this project was based on social justice perspective. So that he and some classmates had organized about, um, um, and, and this was preuniversitario. So, and it was a universitario in a rural area uh, for students who were coming from um, under-resourced schools. So, and he was the coordinator and he was happy. He told me all the details about the classrooms and the things he had to do at university to be able to do it, etc. very proudly. And so I asked him, oh, so do you teach them English as well? Um, as we know that uh, uh, the, the, the exams for university are only in uh, Spanish um, uh, sciences, maths and history, but not English. So, but anyway, I asked him, so do you teach English and um, to these students? And he told me, no, a big no. And he said, no, English has nothing to do with social justice. So what's the point of that? 
what would be the point of teaching English? So that made me think about um, in terms of uh, teacher preparation um, and how, I mean, why is that student teacher thinking that actually teaching English has nothing to do with social justice? It made me think. And today I thought um, that I should uh, share with you uh, some reflections connecting the past or a bit of history about the uh, this perception of teaching English um, or the role of English language, as uh, Michael has called the, the language of commerce um, or, or this kind of economic motive. So um, um, I, I think it's important for teachers of English to think about kind of these motives uh, and uh, that English as a language is not neutral. Uh, there is a lot of, um, I mean, not uh, 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 lots of things that we need to consider when teaching the language so that our actions are consequent to those perspectives. So um, I'm, 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 so this is the question, the one that you're looking at on the screen, uh, the focus of this presentation. Um, so as we know, uh, English language has dominated the world of business, international diplomacy, academic production, and the production and communication of knowledge. Um, so because of that, it has acquired this value of uh, lingua franca and also the value as a commodity. Um, so it's considered a consumer good, uh, so that can be acquired and even transported. So in this sense, the English language acquires a hege hege hegemonic uh, symbolic value in relation to other languages, um, and, and that's the case also in Chile. In Chile, so English is kind of the most desire foreign language uh, by the population um, as it's considered a powerful international language that allows Chileans to be part of this globalized world. Under this premise, several governments in the last decades have invested and created different initiatives to promote the teaching of English at all educational levels. So in this context, uh, this question emerged. But let's look at the past so as to see, uh, to understand the present and also to take some actions for the future. Um, so as you can see in my pictures, this is um, one of the pictures from a nitrate town. Um, so the, ex uh, uh, the extraction of nitrate and we can see a map of all the uh, mines um, at the beginning of um, 20th century and 19th century. So the presence of English language in Chile dates back to the 1800s through the migration of English speakers and the early inclusion of English language in the national curriculum of secondary schooling and actually dates back to 1812. The language arrived um, with English, Scottish and Irish populations who came to Chile to engage in trade that boomed with the opening of the strategically located port of Valparaiso in 1811. So reflecting this migration, Valparaiso became the biggest English settlement until the beginning of the 20th century, with an emerging British colony developing during this era. The British community uh, was very influential um, in, uh, in, in, in the community. Yep. Um, and <coughs> uh, so, all the Anglo culture was very present um, in that city. Um, and it's important to connect uh, the ports here, and that's why I brought pictures of Valparaiso. This is um, an old picture, actually, um, from Valparaiso, the old one. And we can see we don't even have the port. The port is not there yet. And we've got Antofagasta and Punta Arenas because those cities, port cities where uh, we could find these um, British, but also uh, some other migrants from uh, English-speaking communities, um, as I said, uh, around 1800, a bit before as well. So uh, by then, um, so as they moved and migrated to these cities, we could, uh, they formed different colonies and um, they developed different bilingual schools or schools in which English was uh, the most prominent language. And um, so at the same time, uh, created the idea of English also as uh, an elite language. 
As you could see here um, in this uh, slide, uh, this is actually fascinating if you're interested in, interested in newspapers. Um, Valparaiso was a great producer of newspapers, uh, English speaking newspapers. And as you could see, I don't know if you can see the dates, but they are pretty uh, uh, old and uh, they started in the 1800s. And so we've got one copies of English Mercury, for example, from 1843, 1867, 1904, 1894. Oh, sorry about that. Um, these newspapers it gave life to, um, as I was saying, to the English uh, speaking community in this, uh, in the country, uh, but uh, in Valparaiso as well. Though this can be, this is an evidence of that. Um, these are available. So I, I recommend if you're interested at uh, this uh, website so that you can have a look at it. Very interesting. Also the cemetery in Valparaiso. Um, yeah, and, and, and you might be wondering why, why am I doing all this kind of historical? Well, as I said, to understand, uh, to understand the present view of English and uh, what happened before now. So as to understand this thing. So um, in 1812, as I was telling you uh, before, the English language was introduced into the curriculum uh, of one of the first public uh, secondary schools, as you know, Instituto Nacional. And it was included as lengua viva, yeah, opposed to dead language like Latin. Um, so at the same level and significance as French. Um, that's important because at that moment, French was kind of the lengua franca. The introduction of teaching English in the school system was based on the premise that the English language was a wise language sacred to philosophy and to the de death of thought. Um, moreover, English as a lingua viva was seen as needing to be taught, not only to enrich the culture, but also to prepare professionals such as journalists and merchants and travelers. So that's important as well, because this idea, imagine 1812, we already have this perspective of transaction, yeah, being English as um, that uh, with that sort of economic drive. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention this. This is the first newspaper of Chile, Aurora de Chile. You can also find um, uh, the copies in uh, Biblioteca Nacional. So that's uh, very interesting. And here it's the plan. For, for, yeah, Instituto Nacional, kind of the syllabus. Um, by the uh, following uh, oh, uh, this uh, Instituto Nacional and, and, and that in integration of English in uh, that school, um, by the end of the 19th century, we know, and people from UNCE, from Pedagogico, know uh, this very well, um, the first university in Chile proposed the promotion of the study of foreign languages. Uh, such as English and French. So uh, um, the rector, Bello, um, talked about um, this and in his opening speech. So he asserted that the young university should study foreign languages and their related works of literature as a means of bringing the gap between Chile and other more advanced societies in Europe and the United States of America. Following this, uh, by the end of the 19th century, um, so teachers of English started to be professionally prepared at uh, Pedagogico. Um, so uh, German academic Rodolfo Lenz, uh, he was recruited uh, by the government, by the Chilean government at that time. Uh, so he was recruited in Germany to come to Chile and educate future, future teachers of English and French and also German too, and I think Italian, if I'm not mistaken. So um, he developed uh, the program uh, for training uh, future teachers of English. So we're talking about by 1893, um, that was uh, the case. Um, so we know that uh, that's the case. So by the beginning of the 20th century, English was taught in several public secondary schools in the northern part of Chile, Valparaiso and Santiago with the purpose of educating students to contribute to the building of global trade. This mission was highlighted uh, by the researcher Veda 
And she, uh, in her study, actually, in 1942, she published uh, that um, English, uh, um, where the four languages were taught. So in the case of French, uh, French was taught in the center and German was taught primarily in the south because of all the migration. Yeah. So English, north and also Valparaiso because of the um, colonies that we uh, looked at just uh, previously. So um, by the beginning of the 20th century, um, yeah, English was uh, taught in several public uh, secondary schools, as I mentioned before. And um, so, and, and um, interestingly, um, in this case, by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we know that, um, and look at what um, these researchers said at that time, I mean, reflecting the spirit of why teaching, why English was taught at schools uh, in our country. Uh, so they capture, yeah, the study of English, they capture the best markets for their products, and these countries are among the best markets in the world. So again, this idea of trade, very present. Uh, by the end of the 20th uh, century, um, I mean, until the 60s, we could say, um, English was taught uh, at the secondary level in most uh, public uh, schools, liceos and private also secondary schools as one of the optional foreign languages offered in the curriculum. In addition, some bilingual private schools offered and still continue doing it, Programs with curricula developed both in English and Spanish. Uh, it's important to say that they sometimes follow international curriculum, not the national curriculum. However, secondary uh, education for Chileans until 1965 was not compulsory. Uh, therefore, English language teaching was largely restricted to the elite because those were the ones that attended liceos. Um, until introduction of longer um, uh, school retention, jornada completa, uh, only eight years were compulsory for Chilean students. So it was only until 2003 that Chilean uh, were required to complete 12 years of schooling. In the final decades of the 20th century, significant educational report reforms were introduced that affected the teaching and learning of English. Um, that's important to say that, um, so we've got, um, and this has to do with after dictatorship, um, that, um, um, uh, we've got also kind of the, the implementation of these standardized tests um, as an entrance entry point uh, to get university, excluding um, foreign languages that affected dramatically also the kind of um, uh, the interest uh, students and also parents too. Um, so uh, in addition, in, in the eighties, uh, Pinochet uh, dictatorship, imposed demands on higher education that limited the ability of universities to engage in the preparation of future teachers of English. Firstly, the education of future, oh, sorry. Firstly, the education of future teachers was demoted from university level to a technical and vocational status. This move was reversed with the restoration of democracy in the 90s and progressively the preparation of future teachers of English has returned to university level. Um, secondly, the dramatic privatization of higher education um, promoted, I mean, um, yeah, the dramatic privatization of higher education during the dictatorship meant a proliferation of universities often preparation of future English teachers at the secondary level. So it's important to know that uh, by 1980, only eight universities prepare teachers of English, and we have had a peak of 40 universities at the moment, there are less than that, so important. So the promise of bilingualism, um, and this is the thing uh, we um, very common in, uh, uh, in, in discourse and also policy. So the promotion of English and the aspiration of the country uh, to become a bilingual country in, in the new century had political and economic view, motives. With the advent of democracy, the perspective of the English language as a tool that facilitates the spread of knowledge, communication and commerce was integrated as the main purpose of teaching English in the first stage of educational reforms. Another major educational reform toward Chile bilingue was the inclusion of the English language as a compulsory subject from fifth to 12th grade in all types of the schools. Um, 
also, it's important to say that most schools nowadays um, start teaching English from first grade or, or even from kindergarten, uh, but uh, by law, it's compulsory only from fifth grade. And in, another thing I need to mention is the idea of Chile bilingue, only considering English and Spanish, not considering the other variety of languages um, that are spoken in, in, in the country, especially indigenous languages. Um, so, and according to several studies conducted in Latin America, and re uh, in Latin America recently, instruments of tell reasons are the main motivation for learning English, especially related to employment and study abroad opportunities for the elite, not necessarily for most population. Um, so this idea of uh, la promesa del inglés, um, it can be seen here in the discourse. This is just, this is part of another study, but um, in terms of the school, and we, we can see um, this promise of English like, like a, a commodity, and also this, like a tool that it's absolutely necessary for students to develop if they want to be part of the globalized world. And that globalization means uh, commerce and trade in most cases. Yeah. So those are examples of schools. Uh, one, which is a private school. It's not one of the called the bilingual schools. It's a private school um, with many hours of English. So um, important to say is that although English language teaching is part of the national curriculum, pedagogies vary according to the type of the school and also the conditions uh, for learning. So public schools, um, large uh, classes, 45 students per class, high enrollment of students from lower economic income households. Textbooks are provided and English generally uh, correspond twice a week. Um, subsidized schools, on the other hand, the largest group and have the highest enrollments in the country. The students usually belong to lower middle class families and level of English and certification starts to be apparently more significant. There is an aspiration there to get access to this commodity. And on the other hand, private schools um, value high proficient teachers are all native speakers of English um, and they promote overseas study trips and attempt to provide bilingual education and they have typically lots of um, uh, hours and also they choose their different textbooks. So um, yeah, so I mentioned this type of schools. Um, I know that most of the people who are here are Chileans so they know the type of schools. But what it's interesting is to analyze um, the results of students, I mean, the results of tests and levels of English, if we want to call it. Um, interestingly, re recent studies have made explicit that the different levels of achievement in English language teaching are directly related to inequality and the socioeconomic disadvantage. So public school students demonstrate the lowest levels of achievement with lessons focusing. So that's the public, whereas private schools uh, with uh, better results. Therefore, it seems that English is stratified by social class. Effective learning is not much rooted in the type of schools learners attend, but rather in the socioeconomic background of the students. Yet the socioeconomic backgrounds become visibly different as the students from specific groups tend to attend one specific type of schools. Um, as you know, then um, English, the English language, uh, also has this symbolic function as the marker of higher social status. So it's typically, um, and it's related to progress, technology, economic development, lots of Anglicisms um, we can find in the Chilean um, Spanish. Yeah? So recent studies have uh, demonstrated that actually it's not um, uh, words and expressions from English are directly taken to Spanish. And um, this idea of the influence of English in the economy, trade and advertising seems definitely directly related to a neoliberal system implemented as we know in the last four decades. So as to finish now, we're getting uh, to the end. In conclusion, um, the promise of English as a useful commodity for effective entry into the workplace in the globalized world is still predominant in our country. This perspective perpetuates an instrumental, reductionist and elitist vision of the use of this language. Therefore, 
To keep repeating that English opens doors is highly problematic. Since it limits the role of the language and doesn't allow other arguments that go beyond the economic ones, such as access and appreciation of different cultures, scientific achievement, potential, potential increase of confidence, and social and cognitive skills, aesthetic experiences, and enjoyment of works of art, literature, and films in the original language, as well as awareness of diverse linguistic system, one's own, and others. English then, English teachers are called upon to create discourses of resistance and actions consistent with those discourses by engaging in actions to cultivate integrative and inclusive arguments for learning English and other languages. Finally, I conclude this presentation by encouraging English language educators to empower themselves and collaboratively seek new pedagogical arguments and practices for English language teaching based on social justice. New perspectives that allow traditionally marginalized sectors to not only have access to the English language, but that the English language learning and teaching experience contributes to their lives as citizens who seek more than economic well being and who wish to develop and enjoy the language, the English language, to understand their own culture as well as other diverse cultures. So as I started with the anecdote with this student teacher who told me that English has nothing to do with social justice and actually he'd rather teach maths rather than English or uh, other thing because English is just the language of trade or language of not useful. Uh, I believe we can do more than that. English can, and actually in the English classroom, can be a space uh, for us to um, uh, uh, to find out and to discuss what the community wants, the social issues that are part of that community and how we can resist and act on them. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, profesora, por su presentación. Eh, recordamos a la audiencia que puede colocar sus preguntas. Este es el momento en el que podemos tener un a little question and answer session. Eh, Maximiliano, no sé si tenemos preguntas, perdón. Yo reviso y según yo no hay. Ok. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe uh, I might ask some questions that I, I've been wondering about. Uh, but both of you, I don't know if you want to answer them, uh, any of you. Uh, has to do with the, the political climate we have here in Chile now and the and the way in which education is being seen, uh, the way in which critical pedagogy or, or, or this type of education might help us to improve our educational system uh, facing what we have in front of us, right? Like our changing the coming constitution. I don't know if you have some thoughts about that, the way in which we should be facing that stage Malva, I don't know if you have some ideas. Yeah, I, I was thinking, uh, something I've been thinking and kind of reading, um, especially from some researchers from University of Chile, eh, Marco, um, um, eh, about kind of multilingualism. Um, the constitution um, proposes, the new proposal uh, talks about kind of multi multilingual language and actually um, guaranteeing that a uh, right uh, so that all communities have access uh, and can uh, communicate in, in, in their own language and also be educated in the language. And that's a really interesting thing. And not only interesting, I think absolutely necessary. And I think teachers of English can help in that because the, uh, we can help with uh, language learning methodologies uh, uh, in terms of how to teach uh, different languages and things like that. So I think uh, that's a very good thing. Also, it recognizes Chile as a multilingual country. Very, very important. I mean, uh, till, 
today we've got this predominant discourse about in, uh, Chile as a monolingual country, and actually it's not. We've got many indigenous languages. Many people speak different languages at home. But the thing is that it's they, it, the languages they speak are not the ones that are pri privileged ones like English, and that's the issue. So. Um, actually, I'm very positive about that. I do want that uh, to be passed, uh, and, and I hope uh, we can work a bit more in multilingual and multicultural society in which um, everyone is respected. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you. That's the. That, I mean, I mean, that's perhaps the the future in, in language instruction around the, our country. I believe. I hope. In fact, okay. Um, I'm going to read a couple of questions we have now. Okay, so um, for any of you, the very first question comes from Christopher Neira, and it is like this. How do you apply critical education in the classroom while teaching English as a second language? I don't know maybe Professor Apple might want to help us with that idea. Well, um, this is, it seems like a simple, a simple question that it's actually extremely complicated. Ask, um, where are the students from? Uh, what are the ways in which class is intersected by racializing forms and policies? What kind of resources do we have? So one of my favorite schools, for instance, is a, a school called La Escuela Fratni is in Milwaukee. It is filled with, um, it's a very poor community. Milwaukee is the third most residentially racially segregated city in the United States. Um, and Wisconsin, the state that it's in, um, the budgets have been cut massively for exactly these kinds of programs. Right-wing arguments are that uh, this is the United States, we all speak English which has never been the case. And that's an ideological attack. Mm -hmm. So it was very clear and exactly correct about when was that the case? And you know, it really is a, a, a very dangerous position to take both in Chile and the United States. Now, it also has a school board and sort of the governance part of the city of Milwaukee that controls the schools that um, was very performance related. And it meant that uh, they wanted guarantees the test scores would go up. And the most important things that people in Milwaukee test are English language reading and mathematics. They don't test English ability, in quotes, English literacy. So all of that was working against them. They mounted a three-year campaign to have the right to only hire bilingual teachers, to have uh, the curriculum partly formed an interaction with the community uh, and 60% of the community were Spanish speakers. Now that doesn't mean they all speak the same Spanish and that there's no tensions in the community. It's a bit like, you know, are you from Peru or Santiago? These are very tense kinds of situations and the right mobilizes using these fractures. But they began then, they, they took a position and in organizing with the teachers union, which was very, very important that the syndicate backed this. And they said, every subject will be taught for one month in Espanol. And then the next month, every subject will be taught in English. Instead of a situation in which Spanish speaking uh, kids um, would be, you know, would, would be failing constantly. Now that was extraordinarily important, but it also, they, they had bare walls, an old school, and they had actually a Chilean exile um, muralist who lived in the community and came and worked with the children, especially the Spanish speaking children, to recreate on the walls of the school where they were from from Valparaiso, from other places in the South. So it felt like home. And that's actually quite easy. You know, curriculum is also about an environment in which makes these things become powerful and meaningful. So uh, um, again, uh, that has been a, a major gain. However, 
and this is a point I want to make that's extremely important. I mentioned that the right never sleeps. So these schools are under, under threat, but it's not just the right that has made this a threat. As Mopa reminded us brilliantly, English, whether we like it or not, is seen as a form of cultural capital by elite groups. So Milwaukee has a school choice program that have neoliberal ideological mechanisms thrown in that says parents can choose the school they want their children to go to. And many upperly mobile middle-class white parents, white is the, no, that's not about color. It's a signifying political device. They identify as we're white. Um, then use that, that regulation to transfer their children to that school. So instead of a 60% majority Spanish-speaking school, it's now a 30% majority. It meant that many of the African Americans now feel, who were 40% of the kids in school before, now feel marginalized and there's tensions building between Spanish-speaking kids and African American Black parents, and the teachers feel caught. So you'll forgive the, the long answer, but one of the things we're learning is solutions often are brilliant, but they also carry contradictions. Yeah. And we understand race powerfully and the ability of the white middle class and elite groups to reoccupy the space that has now been opened up for critical pedagogic work. We're not gonna win in the long run. So I hope, that, hope that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read another one, okay? Uh, perhaps this uh, is more related to uh, Professor Paraona rather than Mr. Apple. Um, this is the third question. I find it difficult to have a critical discourse when all teaching materials are associated to economic reasons. Isn't it time to move the discussion to the English curriculum itself? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, yes, uh, actually, as Michael said, one of the things we have to ask ourselves as teachers, I mean, um, kind of, I mean, what is it that we're teaching in terms of curriculum and what materials are we using? Uh, what do they portray? And definitely um, we cannot continue using, I mean, when we become aware of this, it's that kind of, it's even offensive uh, to you to continue using some materials uh, that promote uh, this kind of commerce or just trade. However, and this is the thing, that's why it's so difficult. Uh, textbooks are provided uh, in all schools, yeah, and that's a resource providing provided each kid has that, and it's got an institution about about that. Um, so, what to do about it? Because schools want to want you as the teacher to use those textbooks, so they're going to say you have to use it, and no matter what, you have to use it. It's kind of the proof or evidence so that you're covering the idea of curriculum. Uh, so probably teachers are, um, I mean, live this, uh, go through this experience that they want to do something different, but they are forced to do something, um, uh, I mean, uh, something complete that they don't agree with. So there we get into this conflict and how we can resist and how we can do different things. So probably first we will have to get probably work together and, and, and uh, yeah, working uh, collectively in the school with other teachers, with the networks to find different ways or to find spaces to actually act on. Uh, probably we're not gonna be able to change the whole textbook or the whole curriculum, but we can start asking also parents and students and the schools to get into creating or uh, at least uh, uh, identifying uh, uh, different things, different issues to discuss. I mean, um, uh, and, and that could be one way to deal with it. Of course, it's not easy. And that's the thing. It's very difficult, difficult, complex, a lot of resistance. Uh, it's easier not to do it, much easier. Yeah, just follow the textbook, just get into the curriculum, objective one, objective two. The other stuff, what we're talking about, is much more difficult. However, also it's more gratifying. And as human beings, I guess, and as teachers, they care about students. So if we start caring about our students, caring about where they live, their community, parents, that's one start. Being democratic in the classroom, not just being, I mean, not just telling students what to do, just uh, talking to them, integrating them. That's also one thing. It's little, but super important. If that student is, feels respect in the classroom and well, and so on. Absolutely agree with that. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, the coming question is quite close to that. Um, is it possible to dispute the mandatory curriculum and implement a context-based curriculum, taking into consideration that it may clash against the status quo or the state? I don't know who wants to. Well, Michael can answer that, yeah. Ah, I've spent 50 years trying to answer this question. <laughs> Actually, my God, it has been 50 years. Um, okay. Uh, the first thing is to get a large bottle of the gin and look at it and say, if I answer this, I can have a drink later on. I'm sorry, it's a very bad joke. <laughs> One of the things that actually I purposely use the joke because these questions can be can be quite can produce cynical forms. Mm -hmm. One answer of this is not is for us at universities also to say, what can we do? Yeah. That requires that we change the kind of things that often required as research forms at universities. Let me give an example. In the United States, under conservative presidencies and conservative congresses and conservative state governments, there was pressure to say, how much money did you bring in in research funds? And the government said, we will use only medical model research. It had to be control group and experimental group research. And it had to be published in particular kinds of journals. And only then would you be able to get a permanent job. Otherwise, you'd be kept at a very low salary. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the things that we have tried to do collectively is organize among faculty at universities and that faculties of pedagogy and education to change what counts as research. So the participatory research with teachers and students and communities is valued as much. And that the role of what I call in Ken Education Change Society, that volume that has been translated in Chile, um, what I call um, critical secretarial work. Mm. Part of the things we do is to write the stories of teachers answering exactly this question. Now, that's actually quite important. Okay? That is, I think that the answers do not come only from academic work. They come from below. And there are people who are solving this repeatedly. So when I go, for instance, into favelas uh, in, in um, Porto Alegre in Brazil, and I work with some of the teachers in the teacher syndicate and watch what they're doing, my jaw just drops as they answer the question that has been asked. But I know of very few teachers who have the time to write their stories. Absolutely. They're basically doing two jobs. One, for the examinations and using the materials so that they can keep their, keep their positions. And the other is staying up till 10 o'clock at night and planning other kinds of things that are powerful. So part of this, I think, is for us to de to reskill ourselves so that we, in fact, change the politics at our institutions so that what is legitimate research is often narratives. I've got nothing against uh, serious scientific models. And I think we de-skill ourselves if we don't do that. At least we don't respect the disciplines of that. But that is not the only way we do this kind of thing. So again, I want to say, what are the tasks of the critical scholar activists in terms of assisting teachers and communities in answering these kinds of things? Uh, and that means that um, that, that requires that um, academic publishing houses have to change what they publish as well. So we're working very, very hard collectively to put pressure on some of the most prestigious publishers in many nations uh, to um, publish things that have a much larger audience among teachers, among administrators, among communities, et cetera. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask one final question to uh, Malva, and it has to do with something that, that's been discussed. I'm going to read it just the way it is. 
how can we break the gap between rich and poor people while teaching English? Can we do, uh, what can we do to eliminate the elitist perspective of the language? <laughs> okay, good question. <laughs> actually, very good question. So I was reading the other one. So yeah, very good. And actually a lot of thinking because there are no very, um, I mean, easy answers for any of them. Regarding specifically this one, um, okay, English, I mean, now English is sort of provided to all schools, to all the population. It has to go beyond that. That's not enough. And it ha I mean, when we talk about kind of social justice perspective, uh, kind of considering, um, I mean, instead of thinking about English as being useful for trade or commerce, we need to find other reasons. And that's the kind of reasons. What would be an important issue for communities? What would be if we focus on kind of social uh, problems uh, that are relevant for that community? If we focus on kind of the curriculum on that and we also focus on actions so that we can look at a problem, but we can also look at the actions in our classes too, so that the teaching English is not the grammar, it's not kind of, or it's not only the communicative things for selling things or for taking, or, or for, I don't know, going to the airport. Once I had to teach that and remember that very well. So, and instead of that, focusing on some of the issues, uh, do we have issues about migrations? Uh, yes, of course, that could be. Um, anything about races? race? Do we have any issues about gender? Are there any issues about work, about, and there are many issues, of course, and we can bring them, of course, different levels with different levels of proficiency, but also levels of kind of education, being a child and an adult, it's different as well. But that doesn't mean that you kind of go through some of these issues at different level and with different types of tasks. Instead of writing a complaint, writing a letter, a complaint about something that you bought and it's not working, why not writing a letter to the United Nations? Why not writing a letter to the president of whatever? That could be probably an action, you know, and making it real, making it happen so that kids actually can write the letter to someone, whatever they are, they, they are working on as a project uh, could be something like that. But the most important thing I would say is to actually work together with the community and finding ways together so we cannot change i mean probably if i am a if you know i think my school they don't want to do anything the other teachers no one wants to do anything yeah and i'm gonna try i try yeah i can be successful once twice but then it's a failure is coming because you're not a superhero you're just a human being so yeah if we really want to do something for good it has to be with the community and it's difficult no doubt about it but we need people with us. And that's why it's an excellent opportunity today is an excellent way to make things happen. You know, this is collaboration, just goodwill and, you know, working hard together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we're running out of time. So I must thank you for your time, for your presence, for your guidance, for your thoughts. Thank you very much for being here today. Muchísimas gracias por estar acá el día de hoy, a ambos autores. Eh, esperamos que las personas que estaban viendo esta presentación puedan se vayan con la misma sensación con la que me quedo yo, de haber eh, aprendido, de haber conocido, de haber reflexionado y sentir que no estamos tan solos, <laughs> que es súper importante para los profesores. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael Apple, for being here today. Uh, thank you very much. Mrs. Uh, Miss Malva Barahona for being here with us. Thank you all. And uh, dejamos el link a nuestro diplomado. Está en el chat de comentarios para que lo puedan ver. Y esperamos que nos acompañen en la próxima, eh, el próximo seminario. Maximiliano, perdón, la fecha del próximo seminario. 13 de eh, septiembre. 13 de miércoles, 15, perdón, 15 de septiembre. Miércoles 15 de septiembre. Sí. Miércoles 14, miércoles 14. He mentido tres veces. Claro. Miércoles 14 de septiembre. 18, sí. <risa> ya y no digo vamos nada. a conversar en torno a la eh, decolonización del lenguaje. Va a estar la invitada una profesora de la Universidad de Buenos Aires, va a estar el profesor Cristian Sánchez y va a estar el profesor Miguel Farías de la USACH, de la Universidad de Santiago de Chile. Los tres profesores que están invitados. Perfecto, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Muchas gracias. Gracias.